From the keyboard to the boardroom, this is the business of esports. to the boardroom. This is the Business of Esports podcast. I am Paul Dewalibi. I'm joined today by my friend and co-host, the Honorable Judge Jimmy Barada. For those of you who are new here, welcome to the official podcast of esports. What we do is we cover the most pressing gaming and esports topics and news of the week, but we look at all of it through a business and C-suite lens. We dissect, we analyze the business implications of everything happening in this industry. For our regular listeners, thank you guys for tuning in every week. Thank you for all the love, the, f- the five-star reviews, the ratings on the podcast, sharing it with your friends. If you've done all that, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Jimmy, how you doing this week? Hey, Paul. Having a great, great Wednesday. Day we record. It's always a fun day for me. Uh, happy to have our listeners here. Welcome back, everybody. How are you doing, Paul? I'm good. I'm so excited, Jimmy, for this episode. I'm actually pumped. Um, I will say I teased this episode. So for those of you who watch our Wednesday night live stream. Uh, so that's every Wednesday night at 8.30 p.m. Eastern time. If you watch that live stream last week, you would have heard me say that we have a very special episode coming up. We were going to bring on uh, Marius uh, Adamnica, who is a partner at Segev LLP. They're a law firm like specialized in esports. And so I've teased that episode. Um, and, and that's this week, Jimmy, which is fun, right? You won't be the only lawyer here. You'll have one of your kind here, and we're going we're gonna to hit on all the big legal topics. It takes a lot of pressure off, so I definitely appreciate <laughs> Marius joining us. And we've teased this numerous times, I think, since we, since we all kind of had that private meetings, you know, off, off camera and, and decided to do this episode. And every time we had a legal art article come up, any time that we had anything that really touched on this realm, uh, we, we've been teasing this. And, and so for those long-term listeners, for the people that know that this was coming, it's finally here and, and we thank you for your patience and, and yeah, let's get to it. And we've saved some good topics, right? That's the most fun part. We saved some, we said specifically we weren't going to cover them because we saved them to do them with Marius here. I just want to mention before I bring Marius into the, into the podcast here, um, Segev for those, for those of you guys who don't know, and Marius has been on the podcast before, so definitely go tune into that episode, uh, that he was on previously, but Segev's, uh, one of the biggest or most important esports law firms. Uh, esports practices in Canada. They work closely with many leading Canadian esports companies, including Canada's first esports arena, Canada's largest esports iGaming company. Their lawyers combine really unique, deep understanding of the esports space. They have broad expertise in a number of related fields, which is really important, by the way, because esports is not an island. You need to understand how it fits into entertainment and all kinds of other things. And they really provide their clients with class and industry leading service and strategic advice. Um, they've also worked alongside many video game studios, assess, like, and they'll help with everything from company formation, employment issues, intellectual property issues, corporate transactions, like you name it. Um, these are the kinds of people you want to be working with. They're the kind of partner you absolutely want at your side. And the best part of all of it, they're gamers too, which I think is the big plus. And the only, like, you know, you know, the profit would not have anyone on this show who wasn't uh, at least fond and appreciated gaming as much as I do. And on that note, Marius, welcome to the Business of Esports podcast once again. Thank you. Good to be here. Um, Marius, so I, I don't want to waste too much time here. We have so much to talk about. Um, I want to dive into a bunch of stories that we've flagged over the last couple of months that have, I think, a unique legal component to them. And, and I, I think it, you know, I would love for you to break down and here's how we're going to do it guys for our listeners. Marius is going to break down the legal considerations of every story from seen from one side and the other, cause there's always two sides, right. To any legal dispute. Um, and more importantly, I want, I want to try and make this as relevant for our audience as possible. So we understand the implications, right? Like what, why should we really care about all these things? Like two companies fighting, uh, two companies debating some contract. Like, why should we care and what are the implications for the industry? I think 
is the most important part of all this and what I'm hoping to tease out. So on that note, I say, let's start with this article from PC Gamer. And, and I thought it was an interesting one because it's related to um, loot boxes. And, and I'll put this up here. We'll call this first segment the loot box segment because we have a few stories here on loot boxes. And, and this was about the headline here, Electronic Arts gets $11 million loot box fine overturned. So a Netherlands appeals court ruled that the foot packs, which is the packs of you know cards or players that they sell, are not a form of gambling and that the fine should not have been imposed. Um, in 2018, they investigated it. They found that you know FIFA basically was in violation of gambling laws in the country. So they fined uh, EA. And then uh, that culminated in the 2020 ruling, which laid down this $11 million fine. But it was recently overturned. And the court said the packs were used for game participation, not a game of chance. And it claims that FIFA is a game of skill and the packs add an element of chance. And the packs are not opened in the matches themselves. I think that wording, by the way, Paul, the element of chance is super important for the court's reasoning and determination and can't wait to turn it over to Marius for his interpretation. But also, again, that really relevant here. This is uh, a decision by the what's called the Administration Jurisdiction Division. This is the Netherlands highest administrative court. So for anyone that's been involved in legal trouble, they understand uh, simple filing appeals, how lengthy, lengthy this process can be. And you just laid out that this has been going on since a 2018 investigation. 2018. So, you know, we're starting off with some good news here for EA. Uh, and I just wanted to jump in because one, that element wording, an element of chance, and that it was opened outside of the game matches themselves were kind of interesting highlights here. Interesting takeaways, Marius, for, for I think for your insight as well. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm honestly a little bit surprised by the reasoning the court gave there uh, that you can't open the packs in game. I mean, I don't think that really has anything to do with anything. Um, I think the issue of, you know, generally at law for something to constitute gambling, the sort of back of the envelope test is the three elements. There has to be consideration, i.e. you have to pay something to get a ticket or a chance. Uh, chance, there has to be randomness in determining the winner, and there has to be a prize, something of value uh, that you get it. Uh, I mean, with loot boxes, you, you do have the first two. You do have Sometimes, you know, you pay for them in-game currency or you earn them for playing the game, but most of the time you have an argument that there is some, you're paying something for them. Uh, there's definitely chance. There's, you know, sometimes you get good at good packs, sometimes you get bad packs. Um, again, it doesn't matter if uh, you can open them during the game or not. Again, this seems like something where somebody who doesn't really understand games sort of uh, made this decision. Uh, I think the best argument on loot box regarding loot box is not considered gambling, though, is sort of the, uh, the value of the prize. Um, as long as that prize stays constrained to the ecosystem of that game, you can trade it in for, for the real world cash and has no real world value. Uh, then I think, you know, arguably, even no, it doesn't, loot boxes are not gambling in the mm. broad term, speaking that way. So I think. I think the court came to the right decision, maybe through not the, <laughs> the best reasoning, but they got, they got to the right place in, in the end anyway. Marius, what were those three? Uh, the, what were, uh, the, I think that's particularly interesting for audience. What were the three tests to decide if something is gambling or not? Uh, consideration, which is a fancy legal word for, for paying something of value to get something. So you have to pay for the loot box. Uh, chance. So there has to be chance to use in determining the winner, uh, i.e. not skill. And there has to be a prize that has some sort of real world value. That's interesting. So what you're saying here is it fails on the third, right? Potentially, yeah. or, the, or where you agree with the court's decision here. Um, is the implication, therefore, and sorry to take this on a bit of a tangent, but it's everything. It's what people are talking about these days, right? About making in-game items NFTs, right? And NFTs arguably p- could potentially be traded outside of the game for real dollars, right? Um, if we start seeing more in-game items being awarded as NFTs, does that potentially 
uh, it, does that create problems with loot boxes specifically where today, because you can't take it outside of the FIFA ecosystem, that card has no real world value. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's a very good point, actually. Like that's the, the saving grace right now for a lot of these loot boxes is that, like you said, the, the prizes are bound by the game's ecosystem and have no other value. But uh, once, you know, if you can win something and create it in open sea, then that goes out the window. Um, so that, that would change things uh, a little bit. Um, I mean, hopefully by, by the time, uh, you know, these NFTs become more prevalent in games, a lot of, of sort of the history around the loot box will, will have faded a bit. Uh, we'll see what happens with that. But uh, yeah, that's definitely a, a consideration. Are there, are there like repercussions to a ruling like this? Like, you know, over the last few years we've been doing the podcast, you hear so much about loot boxes and wins and losses kind of on all sides. And, you know, uh, and there was a moment in history, uh, I don't know the exact time frame, where it felt like loot boxes were going to be heavily regulated, right? It felt like the sentiment was turning against loot boxes and, and you know, you saw companies like EA losing court cases like the one they lost in 2018. Um, what do you think has changed, right? Like, uh, and maybe is this, am I viewing it incorrectly? Like, I, it feels a little bit like loot boxes were the big enemy and everyone felt like they were going to be regulated and considered gambling and a lot of heavy handed sort of court case losses. And it seems like that hasn't happened. And if anything, we see here, this is overturned. Yeah, I mean, I think sort of the, the tail that wags the dog on this is sort of public opinion and media coverage and all that stuff. It's, it's not the law. I mean, loot boxes, the same issues existed with loot boxes since, you know, 15, 20 years ago. Just nobody cared until the whole EA Battlefront uh, fiasco, which just kind of, you know, it, it kind of makes me laugh a little bit. It's sort of like there's an expression, um, you strike in one place and but it happens at a number of places, sort of how company sort of maybe gets a bit greedy, there's a scandal, and now suddenly these, these everybody turns on loot boxes as sort of a boogeyman. But it's it's not that much about the law. I mean, laws are there, and a lot of the time, you know, to be frank, nobody really cares that much. Nobody like another example is the daily fantasy industry in the U.S. Uh, you know. For a long time, they were operating and it was totally fine um, as a game of skill. Then suddenly they got to start getting a bunch of bad PR and 50 state AGs started suing them. And a couple of weeks later, the laws didn't change, the, the PR changed. And, and I think the same is true here. Um, so we, we had the initial sort of battlegrounds fiasco. Loot boxes became the target that came out of that for whatever reason. Uh, and you started seeing uh, this being tested, started seeing, you know, like this lawsuit being brought for it. But now as sort of time passes, people sort of turn their attention somewhere else. Um, I think you're going to start seeing a lot less enforcement of this stuff. And not because they're any more or less contrary to the laws than they were before, but just because, you know, the, the laws just keep it ultimately. And if somebody has to actually enforce the law. And if their priorities are somewhere different, then nothing's going to happen. So, so, so oh, sorry, go, go ahead, Jimmy. So, so, I mean, these are some really interesting takeaways, Marius, specifically, I think, not just the misapplication of the law here by this court, which, you know, you kind of indicated may may not quite get it. But what I loved was the change in PR, not in the change of the, the fundamental elements of loot boxes or their application and use in gaming. And what we see here, particularly, is a foreign jurisdiction, or at least foreign to us here in North America. And their application of of a FIFA title, right, and of a FIFA loot box. And we have tons of listeners here that are are working at startups, that are at popular development firms, that are at publicly traded companies such as EA and, and including EA, I'm sure. What you're our legal expert for the day, and for anyone that's listening, that's thinking about developing a game with loot boxes, that's a marketing agency that has clients that have games with loot boxes or even someone that just has children that purchases the, those loot boxes on their credit cards. I'm kind of curious from a PR standpoint, uh, as well as a legal standpoint, I, I guess a take home or a, a generic takeaway as to what are these landmines? What are these issues that we've kind of 
dived into here in detail, but what are the more generic for, for someone that's going to remember two or three things, right? Uh, about loot boxes, about their, their business and their interaction with loot boxes. Uh, I, I think what would, what would you give them as counsel or as guidance, I should say? Yeah. I mean, there are things you can do, like it's not just have or don't have loot boxes. You can implement them in ways that are sort of less likely to cause scrutiny. Uh, like I've seen some of these class action loss of pleadings, uh, in some of these loot box cases, and it's sort of, they just throw the kitchen sink at, at the, the problem the plaintiffs do. It's kind of, there's competition act violations and, and marketing issues and this and that. And a lot of the time, even if broadly speaking, gambling is not an issue, some there are some issues that, yeah, could arise out of that. Like, for example, if you don't disclose the odds of, you know, whatever prizes you're going to get in the loot box, that potentially might raise issues under marketing law. Uh, so, yeah, that, that's one issue. If, uh, if you target them blatantly, sort of at children under 13, that's definitely a, a no go. Um, another big one is oh, we already discussed this, but, uh, you know, the value of the prizes and making sure that there's no easy way to convert them to uh, real world cash. Uh, that's another one. So there are ways to do it to sort of minimize scrutiny uh, or minimize your risk of uh, potential issues down the road. Uh, ultimately, though, if, you know, if somebody wants to sue you, we're going to sue you. Like there's no nothing you can really do as a company to protect yourself 100%, but um, there's stuff to do to, to mitigate, as I mentioned. Um, Jimmy, why don't we, we have another loot box story here, but I think it's interesting to do them sort of back to back because I think this is a different, a different take here. And Jimmy, maybe you want to introduce, um, uh, introduce this one specifically, and, uh, I'll just tee it up for you here. It's the NBA 2K, uh, class action suit. And, and I honestly, I think Marius's, um, takeaways from, from the last story really lead into this one perfectly. So I'm glad we're covering both. Um, you know, so this is a game industry.biz article. The title is Class Action Lawsuit over NBA 2K Loot Boxes Accuses Take Two of Unfair, Deceptive, and Unlawful Practices. That last bit being in quotation mark. And then the sub, I, I, is, are these called sub headlines? I never yeah. really aced that English uh, exam. Uh, it says plaintiff claims monetization model from psychologic, or excuse me, that the monetization model psychologically distances players from the real impact of their purchase. So in essence, and this was a, a story from Monday, March 7th. So this month, uh, where essentially a class action filing in Illinois against take two and specific to NBA 2K, it adds that these loot boxes are particularly attractive to minors who may not understand the link between virtual currencies and real world spending or that such purchases are often non-refundable. I thought that that was an interesting add-in. We, I know we didn't talk about that with the last story, so already questions in my mind for you, Marius. Um, but yeah, again, the complaint really claiming that these loot boxes are targeting these miners who are particularly susceptible, who are using their parents' credit cards and not really uh, aware, I think, of, of the circumstances or the implications of what they're purchasing and, and what it is. So perhaps even more of a fundamental, what is a loot box and, and, and why are these children so susceptible uh, argument being made here? Not, not, not too sure. And I'll just end this and pass it to you, Marius, with saying, you know, that these, uh, that this class of plaintiffs are claiming 5 million USD in damages. So again, as our legal expert for the day, perhaps comparing and contrasting these two issues, you know, we had a nice win for EA in the first story. And here we have take two in hot water uh, in the state of Illinois, at least with a, a bunch of angry parents, apparently mm -hmm. whose children were scammed into buying those $5 2K packs and, and getting all the cool in-game items. Now, I, I definitely don't want to make a mockery of the issue because this is, again, a, a rampant and, and prevalent thing here. But a very interesting take where we had a, a regulatory foreign body deciding whether or not something violated the country's gambling laws. Versus here now a class action of an aggrieved uh, uh, group of people. So curious, uh, your thoughts, your contrasts. Uh, you know, take it away for us, please. Yeah, I mean, uh, like I just said, if somebody wants to sue you, we're going to sue you. Uh, <laughs> my my initial thought in, in seeing this lawsuit is sort of what what exactly is is the claim here, and like you kind of go back to law school and sort of like 
when you sue somebody, you need a specific court. Uh, here it's, I don't know, negligence. Uh, I, I can't really think of a very clear legal basis for this. Um, the issue of yeah, them targeting minors, you may, maybe there's some kind of COPA issues if you're under 13 or there's kind of uh, advertising, certain advertising issues, that kind of thing. Uh, but in general, my, my view of this lawsuit is sort of, you know, just because something is maybe immoral doesn't make it illegal. Uh, but, uh, so I, I'm not sure if the plaintiffs are going to feed on this one. But again, I, I'm not an expert on, uh, I'm not sure if this is filed in um, Illinois. Massachusetts, I think, Illinois. Uh, not an expert in, on Illinois law, but my sort of initial reaction to this is, you know, I'm not sure what the basis of this claim is. I don't know. It's interesting because on the last one, Marius, the the sort of the test you laid out was really simple, right? It's like, does this qualify as gambling? And there are these three criteria that have to be met. Here, the plaintiffs can essentially claim any damages that they want, right? Like the, they claim unfair, deceptive, unlawful practices. It it feels a little vague, right? It, it when you're on the company side. Sort of what is the defense against somewhat what feels like a little bit of a vague accusation here? Uh, yeah, well, a lot of the time uh, you can make sort of pretrial motions uh, just seeking to sort of dismiss the claim on that basis that it really kind of it's unlikely to succeed or it doesn't disclose a, sort of a clear legal cause of action. I mean, there's different jurisdictions have different tests, but there's most courts have that kind of a procedure. Uh, I expect that, you know, one of the first steps in, in this lawsuit will be um, 2K basically going out there and trying to get uh, the claim set aside. And it's actually at this stage where you see a lot of uh, a lot of a law being made in, in video game law and esports law, actually, because uh, most cases don't go all the way to trial and get a full uh, written decision. Uh, if anything, you might get a decision on the initial motion to dismiss. Uh, it might be dismissed. That happens sometimes. Um, or if it's not, uh, maybe the company just wants to make it go away. So they, they'll sell it rather than uh, keep fighting it. But that's, uh, if I had to guess, I would say that would be the kind of the next big step that happens. We might see a story in six months about what happened at the motion to dismiss and whether it was the case was uh, dismissed or not. A question I get asked a lot is, like, where do these numbers come from, right? Like when we're talking about the business side, it's, it, you know, I, I have, always have a good answer, right? A merger, an investment, I, I, I can explain valuation. But like when you see something like this where it says the plaintiffs are seeking, it says at least five million in damages. Uh, just for someone who's not a lawyer like me, it's, it's a bit confusing. What does at least five million mean? Because that, that could mean a lot more than five million. And, and where do they get that number from? Yeah, I mean, uh, maybe I shouldn't say how the sausage is made, but uh, <laughs> you'd be surprised. I don't think that much thought goes into these numbers at the pleading stage. Uh, ultimately, you know, if you actually win a trial and you do have to establish how the, your damages are calculated and there's sort of a lot of thought that goes into that. But, you know, it doesn't take that much effort to just throw out a notice of claim and just put $5 million, $10 million there and you kind of, Figure it out later. I mean, a lot of the time you don't, you know, the rules vary, but you don't necessarily have to state the amount of damage you're seeking. It doesn't really make a difference to the claim, to be honest, to be in a lot of places. So it, maybe some places have rules where you have to state that, but a lot of the time, I think partly it's for the headlines and to sort of put pressure on the company. Uh, you know, the general idea of damages is, you know, to put the person who was injured in the same place as they were before. That's how a calculation would happen if it did. So here it would probably be something like, you know, how much did these kids spend using their parents' credit card? We'll have to figure that out. That's how we calculate. Uh, and if it's a class action, a lot of the time, uh, you know, the court will have to approve a settlement. And, you know, sometimes if the damages are not uniform across all class participants, then you can have a process where like you apply and you tell them, you know, I spent this much or this much happened to me and they determine how much you get. Uh, like an example would be like the uh, NFL concussion settlements. Uh, each player, you know, the NFL was found guilty, but each player had to apply separately and show how they were affected. And there was kind of like a 
a fat, like a matrix set up to calculate how much damage they're entitled to. So that can happen here. It would be a lot simpler and more straightforward. Like it's just probably like I paid this much, pay me back. But yeah. And then, sorry, one more kind of generic question, but I think it's important to tease out here, especially with this episode. Like, how do these things come together? Right? Like, I've bought loot boxes and I've been upset afterwards that I didn't get anything good out of them. Right? Like, should my next call be to you to try and get my money back <laughs> from, you know, take two or like, uh, and I'm being a little bit silly here, but like, how do these kinds of class action lawsuits even come together in the first place? Uh, Honestly, a lot of the time, it's not actually, uh, sometimes maybe it is one angry person, but a lot of the time it's the lawyers uh, that are sort of the gatekeeper on this. There's class action lawyers who, this is what they do. Uh, they sue companies in class actions, and they're always sort of like on the lookout for opportunities, essentially. Um, and sometimes if somebody comes to them and says, hey, you know, I my kid paid for all these loot boxes, so they go and they look, is there a claim here? Uh, they look, you know, how many people paid for these loot boxes? What are my general damages? Um, and then if they want to pursue the claim, they can. I mean, the rules vary. I'm not sure how it is in Illinois, but generally speaking, uh, in Canada, you only need one claim to start, start class action, to re represent a plaintiff. Uh, in a lot of jurisdictions, everybody else who's part of that class is automatically in it. Uh, they don't have to opt in or anything. So you don't need to get, you know, like 50 people together and they all vote and say, yeah, we're going to start this loss. It's going to be, there would be one lawyer and one plaintiff and we're, we're off to a race. Uh, any other, uh, before we move on from, from loot boxes here, Marius, any other final thoughts or, or takeaways for our audience in terms of, you know, legal issues around loot boxes or maybe where you see, um, some of these issues going or developing over time? Is it sort of a, is it a dead kind of topic in the legal world? And most of these lawsuits you think are going to fail? Is it, is it constantly evolving? Like maybe give us a sense of where, where all of this is going with respect to loot boxes. Um, I definitely don't think it's dead. I think it's ongoing. There are uh, a lot of loot boxes, loot box lawsuits still sort of working their way for the court uh, that started a, a year or two ago. Uh, I don't think you're going to see that many new ones in the next few years. I think sort of the, the winds come out of the sales of the sort of this issue and people are going to move on to the next one. Uh, but I think, like you said, once we throw NFTs into the mix, um, you might see sort of like a, a revival of uh, the problems of the loot box because, yeah, that does take away the third. The defense companies would have, you have just saying that, you know, it stays in the ecosystem, there's no cash value for the price. And if you do, if it doesn't, then it definitely looks a bit like gambling. So. Where could the issues there? Um, let's move on. Let's talk about um, M and A uh, and contract sort of disputes. Uh, obviously, we saw this year the biggest gaming M and A we've ever seen with Microsoft and Activision Blizzard. That uh, unsurprisingly has led to a number of legal issues. Um, the one I think we want to talk about today, and there's there's a number we could have touched on. I'm sure we're going to do another episode like this. Uh, in fact, I know we're going to do another episode like this, but the one I, w I think worth touching on today is this one. And Jimmy, I'll throw it over to you if you want to introduce it. Sure. So this is a story uh, where U.S. probes uh, trade by Barry Diller, uh, David Geffen, and also Alexander von Furstenberg. Um, you know, real quick, you know, this group is uh, has a combined net worth in the tens of billions of dollars. Correct me if I'm wrong here, Paul, just like outrageously successful group of individuals. And uh, and what's being alleged here or what's being claimed and, and what's being written about in the story, uh, federal prosecutors and securities regulators are investigating large bets made on Activision just days before the Microsoft acquisition announcement. So in essence, this group of individuals uh, bought options to purchase Activision shares at around $40 a share on January 14th. Uh, at that time, Activision shares were trading at around $63. Uh, meaning the options were already profitable. Uh, obviously, we now know on January 18th, Activision announced that Microsoft would be acquiring the company for $95 a share. So these three men would uh, have stood to gain about $60 million in profit. Um, the Justice Department is now investigating whether any of the options trades violated insider trading laws. And additionally and separately, 
the Securities and Exchange Commission is conducting a civil insider trading investigation. Uh, these defendants were, or I don't know if they're called defendants yet, Marius, I'll pitch that to you, but this group of men were reached for comment. Uh, the, the ones that responded uh, maintained that it was a lucky bet, that they didn't act on any information of any kind, that it was just one of those coincidences. Um, and particularly of note, uh, Diller has actually served on the board of directors of Coca-Cola with Activision CEO Bobby Kotick um, and has described him as a longtime friend. Again, perhaps a relevant detail in the court of public opinion, perhaps not. I'll, I'll leave that for Marius's determination here uh, on our special Segev LLP episode. But kicking it to you, Marius, again, as our legal expert uh, for the day, um, similar, I think, to, to the rundown you offered us with loot boxes in, in, the, in the Netherlands court, uh, if you could kind of run run us through here uh, the considerations, the elements perhaps, or, or just how you view insider trading and the investigation relating uh, to uh, uh, to this issue, to this story. Yeah, so I mean, again, not an expert on insider trading issues. Uh, but my, my biggest sort of reaction to this is sort of, yeah, these guys are billionaires or very wealthy. Uh, you know, why... Did we see what happened to Martha Stewart? Why are they risking <laughs> jail time or, you know, being prosecuted over, you know, yeah, $60 million across the three of them. That's a lot of money, not that much money, although I'm not sure if it's worth uh, what they're going to go through right now. Uh, it's definitely, if it's a coincidence, the hell of a coincidence, uh, definitely doesn't look like, like one. I mean, ultimately, the government's going to have to show that they acted on sort of non-public material information. and unless there's some kind of paper trail that that shows that or somebody actually sort of testifies and provides evidence to that effect, uh, I think maybe we're going to have a, a tough time actually, you know, convicting these guys. Uh, but it certainly doesn't look good. I mean, yeah, there's, uh, there's been a lot of, there's been a lot of actually, not just this issue, I think even like Warren Butts, Buffett's firm got accused of some sort of insider trading related mm -hmm. to the, uh, the Blizzard acquisition. So yeah, there's a lot of uh, issues with, with that transaction, I guess, from, from this end. So, so do we think that absent any paper documentation, that it's really just kind of baseless accusations that should be easily uh, something easy to, to defend against? Is that, I mean... These yeah. are serious claims, but to your point here, it's like how does the federal prosecution plan on proving them absent like that random email, bye, 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 right? Yeah, I mean, maybe they think they, they have something or they can get something. Uh, I mean, ultimately, I think they probably wouldn't be bringing this uh, case forward if they, they thought they were just going to get blown out of water and lose. Uh, I, I think maybe... Either they, they have some paper evidence or they hope that maybe through sort of putting pressure on people involved in the case, they can have somebody, you know, provide evidence. Um, again, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens, I guess. But, uh, you know, if I had to bet right now, I would say that these, you know, it's not going to go anywhere. Or maybe it will be some kind of settlement and it will go away with a fine or something like that. Mary, so I, I want to try and make this story like as relevant as possible to our audience. And I will say, you know, a lot of our audience is of the call it retail trading crowd, right? Everyone's trading their Robinhood account these days and uh, especially gaming stocks where maybe they have a passion or it's a hobby, right? Um, or they may be employees of gaming companies that are public or soon to be public. Like given the amount of activity that's happening in gaming and esports, a lot of these situations may come up where, you know, something may, might happen uh, and could potentially profit from it. Like it would be good if you could to lay out maybe what people should be thinking about in terms of, you know, what, what is the, in the same way, sort of the, what defined gambling, like the, the, those three bullet points, like what should people be thinking about in terms of not insider trading specifically, but when you have information that could potentially lead to you making a profit, uh, unnaturally. Yeah. So, so generally speaking, you know, you can't, if you have that information, you can't, you can't trade on it again, without going into detail, not an expert. That's the sort of the basic idea. Um, especially if you work at one of these big game companies, 
uh, and you maybe you have stock options or something like that. A lot of them will have uh, potentially like blackout periods where you can't exercise your options for sell stocks uh, right before an earnings announcement is made or something like that. So you got to be careful about whatever the internal policies are. Uh, and just generally speaking, you know, you know I, I don't know what the likelihood of if you're a small trader and you're trading a few thousand dollars, the government coming after you and saying, oh, it's probably not huge, but generally speaking, like whatever profit you're going to make isn't worth the risk of taking a lot of time. Um, Let me give you a real scenario. Okay. And then forgive me. Cause I'm trying to make it, like I said, as real as possible for our audience. Your people, everyone's in Discord servers these days, and I see tons of them related to, you know, stock picking and stock trading, right? And someone says, you absolutely need to buy stock XYZ. Uh, I know they're going to go up. I talked to the CEO, and he's posting this in a public Discord channel, right? And it's a gaming company, and you like it, and it's a cool gaming company, and you buy the stock. Now, this guy, we don't know if his information is real or not. He claims he knows the CEO, right? But if I tr- if I acted on that, am I at risk? Uh, again, I couldn't tell you for sure. Uh, my initial thoughts are that again, that's not really non-public information at that point. If it's out there on the internet and some guy's saying it, then you're entitled to act based on that. It's not you know the CEO of a company telling you oh, the earnings are going to be this much or something like that. So something like that. It, it honestly, I don't think it raises a lot of issues. Um, I think the bigger risk of that is whoever that guy is, who he says he is, and 99% <laughs> of the chances he's not. Uh, <laughs> but legally, yeah, I don't think there there is a huge risk um, on that. Uh, I think you're, again, you're a bigger risk of just losing your money. That but, but super important distinction, right? Because it seems like you're indicating on this hypothetical, the source of the information, while relevant and, and potentially damaging, not necessarily as important as how available that information is if you can obtain it from other public sources, correct? Yeah. If it's public, then, you know, the idea is to level the playing field. Um, well, you know, some investors don't have access to more information than others. If it's public and everyone can access that information. If everybody can go on that Discord and see the same post, then there's less of an issue there than if it was actual something that generally only a few people know that is not publicly available. Guys, I, I want to move on because I think the, the next story is really maybe the biggest theme we see around, you know, public outcry and legal issues around esports these days is just player contracts, right? And it probably has been for the last few years, starting with the whole Tifu, uh, you know, FaZe Clan kerfuffle. Uh, Jimmy, let me hand it over to you to introduce this next one here. Sure. Um, so... And again, not just relevant, I think, for today in terms of player and esports contracts, but contracts and contractual negotiation in general, which we all come across in our day to day lives, whether it's negotiating for a car or your lease or, or a business. So hopefully there's some great takeaways on this story. Uh, and I'm looking forward to, to, to Marius's insight here. So this is an article uh, on The Washington Post. It's titled Inside Contract Hell Esports Players Say Predatory Contracts run rampant. And even as esports blossoms into a billion dollar industry, player contract negotiations are uh, in a wild west, so to speak. So, um, you know, this article seems to be an expose piece. It does cover the TFU, uh, as Paul called it, kerfuffle. I love that word. <laughs> Got to use that more. Uh, but, you know, it starts basically with, um, and also, by the way, there's a ton of uh, alleged esports players here that wanted to remain anonymous that came out basically in support of this article uh kind of shining a negative light on their experiences and on their contract negotiation um with with, you know with various teams and in various games and leagues uh it does put the spotlight on jeff blase sang a former player on cloud nine's overwatch league team the london spitfire uh sang who's now 22 claims that when he was 16 was really when Overwatch kind of exploded. Overnight, he was getting all these emails to join Overwatch teams, uh, heavily courted, basically, and a lot of pressure to sign contracts. Um, Particularly, he claimed that these contracts would have very um, stressful windows, where if it wasn't signed within a very short time period, the contract offer would be pulled and rescinded, uh, adding that these were 30 to 40 page contracts, perhaps not enough time to find a lawyer, 
have them review it and offer you counsel. Um, and also particular to these contracts, there were alleged unfair termination clauses that would leave the player without pay, contracts that could trade the player to a foreign country on the drop of a dime, uh, allegations that once the player signed these contracts that the teams would go and then flip them to other teams for a quick profit. So really just a nasty expose, a nasty, nasty rendition of a lot of players' experiences uh, being approached with contracts from various orgs and and how um, unprepared, I suppose, they were. There are comparisons in the article to the NFL, the NBA, and traditional meat sports that do have players' unions that can kind of protect them. There was a notation that, for example, Activision Blizzard has a minimum salary, has health insurance, has a 401k and, and access to mental health services. Again, reference to Tifu's experience with FaZe Clan and the unfair uh, distribution of sponsorship revenue um, and other players that supported that those same allegations that they were just used to drive uh, ad dollars or sponsor dollars, but would only see a small amount of that uh, of what they brought in. Um, but again, in essence, an article claiming uh, or with claims from dozens of players uh, supporting or one another in their allegations, uh, numerous denying to release their identity for obvious reasons, but kind of um, focusing on terms of duress and I suppose unconscionability uh, thrown uh, thrown here and there uh, throughout the article. A really great read, by the way, if any of our listeners have the interest in getting uh, into some of these issues on a deeper level. But uh, to tell us what it all means, uh, contracts in general, of course, uh, as well as the issue facing players, facing teams, facing esports leagues, uh, and publishers and developers, facing orgs, something that really touches, I think, on almost every business in esports. Uh, let's take it to you, Marius, uh, to get your thoughts on this. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of uh, more of a same. Where like it seems like this story comes out every six months of sort of territory contracts and all that, and every time people say, "Oh, it's going to get better," and maybe it is a little bit. Uh, the industry is being more and more professional, but yeah, there's definitely still a lot of this stuff uh, going on out there. Um, especially the issue of sort of this, like you have 24 hours to sign, and we're pulling the offer. Uh, I would tell any player that sort of deals with that, you know call their bluff a little bit like if they spent all this time into sort of recruiting you and figuring out if you're a fit for a team and putting the contract together and trying to sign you like do you think they're really just going to pull the deal because they didn't you didn't meet for this arbitrary deadline uh a lot of the time they're not um uh, especially if you get a lawyer you know i've i haven't really seen them um, very often where somebody gets a lawyer and the lawyer speaks to the team the team knows goes and all you have 12 hours, you don't have time to review it. But generally, when you get a lot of time, the clock stops ticking so, so fast. Um, but yeah, it, it is definitely, it, it's not a good look on the industry to sort of try these high pressure tactics on, on, on people, especially when a lot of them are very young. Like the player in this, con in this story, I think he was 16, he said, when he first got, got offered his contract. So, you know, there's definitely a lot of, uh, room there for sort of, you know, people are going to talk about unionizing or some kind of, you know, some way to protect players more than what, what's going on right now, uh, because it's still it's still not a great situation for players. Uh, and the, the bigger teams have are definitely, uh, I would say, better than, than the smaller teams, but there's still a lot of like small, um, you know, not as well established organizations out there that are very very and vary a little bit more. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely not not fun to see that stuff. And I think, you know, the more stories you see about this, the more pressure there's going to be for some kind of unionization or some kind of governing body or some kind of, some kind of way to protect players. And I think there's there's definitely a need for that, especially because, again, a lot of them are so young and they're not really experienced this these kinds of issues. Uh, Mary, so do you think part of the problem is just not enough players? And, and I'll extend this to not just esports players signing player contracts. Like, I feel like I could extend this to esports companies signing any kind of long-term contract in general. Do you think not enough retain a lawyer to go over this and understand the implications of every sentence? Like, you know, when you get a 30 page document like this, that's usually filled with quite a bit of legalese. Um, 
it usually takes someone like you to translate and make sense of it and, and understand what are those implications. Do you think the problem goes away if just every player, every company retained legal counsel when they got something like this that had long-term implications? Yeah, uh, I, I don't think it goes away fully. Uh, I, I still think, you know, there is a lot more supply than demand out of ever players. Uh, a lot of them, but general situation is the player is just happy to get signed on a team a lot of the time. It's their first contract. They're just like, I don't care. I'll sign anywhere. Give me the jersey. Uh, so even if you get a lawyer, I mean, getting a lawyer helps. It can definitely iron out some of the um, sort of more unfair terms and, you know, protect you a little bit. Uh, but the other issue is a lot of the time teams will just like stick to their guns in a lot of these issues and just say take it or leave it uh, and a lot of the time the players just goes you know take it uh, I've been in the situation with players where I was like no this isn't really fair but they're just they're not willing to move um, you can go try to find another offer uh, or you can take it or not you know the vast majority of the time they'll just like let me sign I'll take it um, I especially have an issue with sort of these sort of um, clauses where like, let a team terminate the contract at any time. Uh, you see this for a lot of uh, the big teams. Uh, there's a few sort of, there's a few law firms that kind of do the contracts for a lot of these teams. They have like, there's like a standard precedent that goes around. Uh, and a lot of these have that initial termination that just lets you terminate the contract at any time. And that's really unfair to the player because, you know, it doesn't matter what else you negotiate in there. It doesn't matter what salary you get or anything like that if a team can just terminate your contract in two weeks notice then it doesn't really matter uh and a lot of the time teams will sort of stick to their guns very much on on, on those kind of provisions and yeah ultimately sorry go ahead no i'm sorry to interrupt you but that was a super important call out and i think that there's probably a handful of others that you would caution people to look for in their con i mean Obviously, any contract probably grounds to to find an expert, to find an attorney to help you navigate through something when it gets to that stage. But specifically, certain clauses or provisions that you would advise us, like the the termination provision, uh, that I'm curious your thoughts. You know, hey, if you're you know based in California, make sure that the venue's in California, right? Or if, if you know other things that I think that you would draw a layman's attention to for any of us here that have experience in contracts or that are going to sign contracts at some point in our careers and in our lives, uh, maybe a couple of other uh, provisions, clauses, whatever you'd like to call them, that you say make sure to, to keep an eye out for those because those are really the red flags or those are really the, you know, the important ones? Yeah, so uh, the termination provision would be the biggest one. Uh, there's sort of like uh, fences, all that kind of stuff. Uh, the ability to move you and if you get traded and if you get uh, consent over that uh, is another issue. Um, but term, uh, that's more of a business issue than like a, a contract issue, but that's uh, often a, an interesting one as well. Uh, you know, sometimes if you're a player, like you want to maybe have a shorter term uh, so you can increase your value and move on to a better contract, but sometimes maybe you want the security of the longer term. Um, so that, that's important as well. Uh, and a lot of it is just kind of understanding what the contract says and what your obligations are. Because a lot of these, yeah, are very 30, 40 page contracts, certain and legalese. Like I, if I wasn't a lawyer, I would, it would take me like 10 hours to go through understand. <laughs> so even if, you know, what you're getting into, if you don't like it, at least you'll know what it is going in. So that's, that's another reason just to sort of get represented and sort of have somebody go through and, and help you with that. Um, guys, I want to, I want to finish with, um, uh, one last contract story here. And I think this is maybe, I'll say it's maybe the most sensational of, of all the stories, uh, we covered today. And, and that is G2 esports and, and Jimmy, I'll let you, you know, I'll let you talk about this, but it's another contract dispute involving one of the biggest esports teams in the world here. Jimmy, you're muted. Thanks, Paul. I was going to say, I couldn't think of a better time to talk about this issue because uh, this week in Los Angeles is NFTLA, and this is a lawsuit between G2 Esports and an NFT provider, Bonley, filed in the Los Angeles Superior Court. So a lot of overlap there, a lot of relevance. 
uh, to any of our, our regular listeners that are in Los Angeles for that convention. Uh, you know, would love to hear back from you on how how the conference is going, how these are interlap or overlapping with one another, what themes and, and things that you hear are going on because this is an emerging industry and, and a lot of uh, activities going on here. So back to the story at hand, uh, to Paul's point or, or reference, uh, this is a Washington Post article. G2 has filed a lawsuit against NFT provider Bondly, again, filed this month in the Los Angeles Superior Court. Uh, essentially, uh, G2 and Bondly signed an exclusive partnership uh, on June or in June of last year, 2021. Uh, they were essentially contracting, by they I mean G2, contracting with Bonley to utilize G2's unique IP uh, and resources to launch an NFT uh, program or vertical to their business. Um, Bonley was essentially tasked with developing and acting as the sales agent for a G2 NFT brand, an NFT line. It's a little vague in terms of what they were going to bring to light. Uh, however, if, if you go to the Bonley website, they do describe themselves as a company that executes essentially every step of the NFT process, uh, something that, that I think we see often uh, with a, a lot of NFT agencies that are particularly uh, coming or rising uh, with, with, with the rise of NFTs as well, of course. Uh, so in the lawsuit, G2 speculates anticipated profits and damages exceeding $5 million. There seems to be some speculation there again. Uh, um, but but uh, basically, G2 alleging that they couldn't come to an agreement over who was in charge of the responsibilities outlined in the contract, uh, that Bonley uh, essentially stated they couldn't deliver, that they sought to pause the agreement, that G2 refused and thereafter uh, sued. So um, super interesting issue, I think. Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, something that we see often with NFTs uh, today with uh, with a lot of speculation, I think, and, and criticism of others kind of joining in on that train. Uh, but a, a legal contract in nature uh, applied here to a, an emerging industry, uh, as well as an e a competitive esports organization seeking to really expand uh, what, what they can do and, and how they interact with their community. So um, really interested, Marius, in your insight. Uh, legal arguments, I suppose, in support of G2 and their expectations for Bonley to develop this NFT with their IP, perhaps uh, considerations in support of Bonley, uh, who um, again is claiming that the roles outlined in the contract were uncertain, and how perhaps how you reconcile that with what they're claiming on their website, and perhaps what G2's reasonable assumptions or or what we can reasonably expect from a conversation between the two of them, and what that looked like, um, and of course uh, some similar takeaways, uh, more generic. Uh, to contracts in general. Yeah, I mean, um, without knowing exactly, you know, what the contract said and what was supposed to happen and didn't happen, it, you know, I, it's tough to say who who's right here or who's going to prevail. I mean, generally speaking, but like you said, it, it seems like a pretty straightforward case of you know, G two wanted to get product on, they signed a contract for it, and bond they couldn't deliver. Uh, I'm sure if there was some kind of wiggle room there or some kind of vagueness in the contract, if Bonley could still deliver, uh, they would much rather have done that than, you know, risk a lawsuit and risk the, the bad PR that's going to come out of it. Uh, because now if I'm a company and I'm looking to hire Bonley and, you know, to deliver what it says on their website, and apparently they can't because, you know, they just got sued by G2 because for that uh, specific issue. So, you know, if I had to guess, I'd say that, you know, Bonley actually couldn't deliver and probably maybe overpromised uh, something in the contract. Uh, and yeah, it's it's kind of unfortunate to see. Um, again, not, not sure if there's that much in the way of sort of general legal lessons for uh, general lessons for sort of esports and contracts in general, uh, except sort of the usual contract thing of try to be as specific as possible, don't leave room for vagueness, because you know. And I, I always kind of think of that when I'm, when I'm drafting contracts. And I think I'll really do, do too. Like 15 minutes spent, like carefully wording something, can save you know like hundreds of thousands of legal fees down the road. It's kind of it's a little bit ridiculous. Um, but yeah, um, I don't know how much of the issue here was the contract being vague, or how much of the issue was fondly not being able to deliver. Probably the latter. 
but yeah, it's unfortunate to see it. I, I will note how shocked I am again that there is sort of lawsuits and allegations going on with something relating to NFTs. Uh, <laughs> there's definitely a lot of uh, definitely a controversial topic, I'd say, uh, and even what's going on with that. Uh, I guess this is more more of that. Marius, what, how does it? How does something reach this point? And I guess you know what would be the advice for if you're you're in G2's shoes or you're in Bondly shoes, sort of leading up until this point, right? Like, at what point, if you're a supplier, do you do you worry about getting sued? At what point do you hire a lawyer, right? At what point do you? And if you're on the other side, you're on the G2 side, and someone you've hired it hasn't delivered, right? What steps do you take? And in what order, right? At what point does yeah. it get to the lawsuit? And what do you think should happen before that? Uh, in terms of worrying about getting sued, I think you should be worried from the beginning. Uh, but uh, uh, in my experience, a lot of people aren't. Uh, a lot of the time going into a deal, people just go in with good intentions and think, you know, it's all going to work out. And it's just kind of like, fine. You know, we know these guys sometimes or like, no, we'll, we'll figure it out. That kind of thing. Uh, so a lot of the time, people don't spend a lot of time on papering stuff very specifically. They just we'll, we'll put some vague language there and like we'll tell them like, look, you know, this could be an issue. And they'll say, oh, it's fine, it's fine. Okay. It's sort of that announce the prevention is worth a pound of cure uh, because you know when stuff goes wrong, um, you know, you look back and go like, oh, maybe we should have sort of papered that more more clearly. Uh, but in terms of how it gets to this point. Uh, you know, a lawsuit is, is almost never, I would say, if you're in G2C, it's not first uh, step. Uh, just because you're not going to, it's not really going to get you anywhere. Uh, yeah. You know, you're going to spend all this money on legal fees. And unless the damages, you know, are really worth it, you're going to, you might pay more for lawyers when you have to get back in damages order. And you're going to have to deal with the hassle of this lawsuit for years and years if it doesn't settle. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure that, you know, G2 didn't just say you didn't perform to them the next day. There's usually a negotiation there's, you know, there's meetings, there's, you know, meetings and angry emails. There may be angry, angry formal letters. And if nothing happens, then, then it goes to loss. But it's not the first, uh, not the first call. And what's like, what's the time frame on something like this? Cause I think a lot of people sometimes are, are, or underestimate the 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 time frames involved here like assuming g2's in the right and it's a slam dunk case and you know uh that we we know we can see the future and they're going to win it how like how many months years like what 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 is the time frame for g2 to ever see any money in something like this if, if in terms of like pursuing the lawsuit yes uh again it it really varies by like jurisdiction uh, and how backed up the courts are and all that stuff. But assuming it goes all the way to trial, at least a few years, you know, two, three years would be my guess. Um, wow. You know, the vast majority of lawsuits, I think that's one thing people don't really get is they they don't go to trial. Uh, I think like 99% of lawsuits don't go to trial. I'm not sure I'll get what the official stat is, but it's something like that. Just because the trial is so expensive and there's so much risk. Uh, so they always, almost always settle beforehand. Uh, the litigation process is just kind of a way to exert pressure on the other side of the settlement more than a way to hmm. actually go to trial. So, Love that insight. It, so, I mean, yeah, if this goes to trial, yeah, years, but it, it might settle shortly before that. There might be some kind of, you know, pre-trial motion. I'm not sure you'd have a motion dismissed in this case because it seems like a pretty straightforward case. Of, you know, there's a contract, how to interpret it, but it's not like a blatant frivolous claim or anything like that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not going to be a short time and it's, it's not, I don't think G2 is going to be happy at this and this process, whatever happens, even if they win, even if it goes to trial, uh, and the other issue is even if you win actually enforcing that judgment and collecting from, uh, the defendant as a whole other ball of wax, <laughs> they have entire courses in law school about, you know, creditors remedies and how you, how you collect that's, that's a whole other thing too. Not only if they don't have the money to pay, then you're out of luck anyway. You spend all this money and time in a lawsuit that didn't, didn't go anywhere. I'm sure they'll be long gone by then. That's such a funny, uh, a funny addition, I think, to your commentary. I just wanted to add in support of what you said, Marius. You know, I, 
I practiced in, in California. I probably had over 100 cases venued in Los Angeles and in the LA Superior Court right on point, I think about two years minimum before this ever even sees anything um, as far as courtrooms are concerned. Obviously, there's procedural uh, hearings and things of that nature. But I just wanted to mention LA in particular is so backed up that uh, they have an expedited system for certain cases. And all you have to do as a defendant or as a party to that case is file enough motions to get it kicked out to a different circuit in, in Southern California. And then you kind of restart the clock again. So um, it, it's a tactic that, that some of the, the less ethical lawyers used where they would just file random motions. The court would say, oh, this isn't on our fast track because it's becoming complicated. Let's put you in Torrance. Let's put you in Norwalk or you know, somewhere outside of L.A. And essentially, you go in front of a new judge, a new courthouse, and you kind of start over again. And it extends the life cycle of this case from you know, two years to sometimes three or four. Uh, and like you said, that's one consideration. The other consideration is, is this Bondly company good for it, right? Are they even going to pay? So I, I, I just think you hit every relevant uh, angle of this, of this case on it, right on its head. Yeah, the, the I, I, courts. Go ahead, Marius. The courts being backed up is an issue here as well. Uh, here in, in British Columbia, where I am, if you want to book a trial date, uh, it's minimum 18 months ahead of time. And they release the court dates every month. And basically what happens is every law firm in the city has all their assistants calling at 8.30 a.m. on the day up and hoping they get through so they can book a court. It's, it's ridiculous. Wow. Anyway, that's just a random tangent. Um, yeah. You mentioned, I think, something also that was an important consideration here, like the reputational damage, right, of the lawsuit here to like – Bondly may be in the right here. We like right. We don't. We haven't seen the contract, and and as you said, right, without having seen it, we it's hard to sort of say very specifically who who's in the right or who's in the wrong. Um, but there's reputational damage in the lawsuit to Bondly. Um, sort of takeaway for people listening in general who may be entering contracts in the esports space, like. How long does a lawsuit like this stay out in the public? Washington Post article aside, right? Like, is it something that exists forever and is this sort of a stain on their brand forever, whether they win or lose? Or, or is it like, is it like a driver's license where every seven years, you know, it gets white? I don't know. You know what I mean? Like, is there some long term ramification of, of entering and being a party to a lawsuit like this? Yeah, I mean, it does It does stay out there. I mean, the articles are obviously going to be there however long they're, they're up on the sites. Um, but most court systems have like, the, you can, re they're public and you can research for, search for filings and see who was sued when and see the pleadings and all that stuff. So a lot of the time when you're buying a company, one of the things you'll do is you'll look, do a litigation search and see if they've been sued anywhere and if they've been sued what. So, you know, if Bondly ever gets acquired, and if something like that happens, everybody's going to, anybody's going to, even without these articles being out there, somebody's going to do a search and see this lawsuit and ask them about it. And, you know, if it's 10 years down the line, they might not care. But it is, it is something that sort of stays out there. Um, and that's, yeah, that's one of the reasons where if you're, you're Bondly in this case, you want to avoid getting sued separately from the actual lawsuit itself. Uh, just the reputational damage can be significant. Uh, a lot of the time, you know, I like to say that the threat of a lawsuit is actually more effective than the lawsuit itself. Uh, if G2 told them, look, we're going to file this if you don't do X, Y, Z, they actually have more leverage before they file it. Because once they file, then it's out there, then it, it's gone. Bonnie well, doesn't care as much. Anymore. But if they want to avoid yep. the PR hit, then we're going to be more likely to, to settle. That's interesting. Um, uh, Jimmy, did you have anything to, before we wrap up here? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to mention, you know, you had, uh, shouted out and we, we love having you back, Marius. I just wanted to call our, our listeners to their attention. Marius was on episode 158. That was October 29th of last year. Please go take a listen to that one as well. It's a little bit more about himself, more about Segev. Uh, but, but Marius, I, I loved having you here for this. We, we really appreciate your insight and yeah, Paul, go, go for it. No, Mary, uh, just uh, wanted to throw it over to you. Like, uh, you know, we're obviously we want to bring you back and cover more of these stories. Uh, and I know our listeners, at least on the live show, when we teased it last week, we're really excited for this. So I hope uh, I hope everyone who listened enjoyed it. Uh, let us know, obviously. But how you know, how can people find Segev, Marius? Like, uh, how can they reach out to you? How can they find you? 
other than coming uh, through us, right? They're more than welcome to ask me or Jimmy, uh, more than welcome to reach out to us directly and we can connect you, but how can they reach out to you directly? Easiest way would probably be my Twitter, uh, at Marius.Adomnica. Uh, it's also got my Discord on there. I'm on Discord all the time. Uh, and also, yeah, if you look me up, if you just Google me, Marius Adomnica, you'll see my, my site and our, our firm site and as my email, all my content information there as well. Very cool. Uh, and obviously, uh, you know, like I said, feel free uh, to our many listeners. You know how to reach myself. You know how to reach Jimmy. You uh, hopefully listen every week, tune in every week. We're more than happy to connect you if you're looking for uh, really, really smart legal advice uh, in the gaming and esports world. You absolutely need to be talking to the guys at Segev. Uh, they're the best in the business. So um, on that note, guys, I uh, that wraps up this week's episode. Um, there will be. This will be an extra episode this week, so stay tuned for both our live stream and our normal podcast episode. Uh, let us know how you like this. Uh, we're going to come back for a second episode on other legal topics. There's so many to cover. And uh, as always, guys, don't forget the future is fun. We will see you next week.